Okay, so thank you very much, guys. I'm like, this is amazing to be here today. Uh, I mean, it's a super, super nice experience. Um, well, thank you very much for, for inviting me. So, well, first star, as usual, like talking about who I am. So I'm Lucas. I'm from Spain, currently living in Barcelona. I am being game designer. Now I'm product manager for almost uh, 15 years. I'm also teaching game design in several places. And I've made games for uh, console, uh, mobile, both, well, especially like indie games, because I work in AAA, but it didn't, it didn't work, right? So uh, I've been in many places and I've done uh, many things. Um, most of them, um, uh, many of them, they are like based in, in Spain, so I, I'm not expecting <laughs> most of the people to, to be aware of, of, of it. But I mean, I've been in places that probably you, you've heard like Septolab or Get Love, Tequila Works. I've been speaking at the GDC. I've been judging the Independent Game Festival. I've written a couple of times in, in Gamma Sutra. Um, yeah, and here you have some of the games I've I've made. So maybe you've played them. If so, I, I hope you 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 enjoy it. And this is like my <laughs> my don't know. I mean I, I just like things I, I feel a bit proud and I like to share of things that I, I've done. This this thing that probably you, you don't know are like uh, some prizes, awards are given in, in a pretty important event in Spain. Um, but yeah, I look at that and say, okay, after 15 years, man, I, I've, I've done stuff, right? So, uh, so today I want to talk to you about overcoming the, the, the fear of, of, of changes. So talking about how changes are something that is always there together with game development, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. And also actually how these Changes usually you can use them for your advantage um, to gain a better game developer or 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 game designer, and also how to survive <laughs> in this jungle that is the, the the game industry. So let's go. So changes, uh, changes are scary, right? Especially if if they are big or if 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 we believe these changes are going to be big. My own career is filled with, with changes. I, I start uh, creating, well, working on AAA game for Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. And then I have to move to working in WiiWare and other downloadable titles. After a while, I had to move to make mobile games as a game designer. Then I became product manager. And eventually, now, the last thing I'm into is about researching and, and learning through through games. Um, some of these changes was, were um, pursued by, by me, but others, no. They just happen. You're in the middle of something that's bigger, that you can control, um, and you are there. And we can find a lot of stories, um, motivational pictures and books about embracing change in your life and stuff like that. But we forget, I believe, something that is video game development is all about change. You, you, you cannot be expecting creating games without changing because our video games are based on technology, um, sometimes cutting edge technology and technology because if technology is constantly evolving. So yeah, just, just, just to give you some, some context, well, my, my, my context, like 15 years ago. So 15 years ago, this is the, the, the game that everyone, everyone wanted to copy, right? This was making a lot of money. And this is the model that, that I followed when, when I started my first job in the game industry. So these are the, the, the games I, I, I have in mind. These, these games were released between 2004 and 2005. What years, actually? Um, when, when you became a game developer, you are thinking of the games that you've played, and, and these are the expectations that you have. Um, yeah, I, at that 
time, I, I realized that new consoles were going to be out. So I was expecting that, well, more powerful technologies and stuff like that. But I wasn't expecting like so many things that it happened. So for example, in 2007, it was released the iPhone. And then the next year, uh, the App Store. And then Angry Birds. And together with Facebook and the social games. And then we have all this crazy mobile free-to-play industry that basically wasn't there when, when, when I started working. We have also the things that, that trigger, I guess, the, the what called the one of the golden age of, of the of the indie games that create another kind of business, I will say, not only with, with games, but the global game jam. Well, Carnival that brings create a, a, almost a new genre, this, this runner games, uh, Kickstarter, and also Minecraft. Yeah? All, all these things weren't there when, when they start. Like more things, um, YouTube. <laughs> YouTube was in 2005. And all these things about YouTubers and influencers and streamers, um, games that you're creating, thinking of, of streaming them, was, wasn't there either, like, like, like Twitch. Things that are also aside to, to, to games, like gamification. Gamification, well, it was really the concept and everything was really developed, I mean, developed in, in, in 2008. And to end with, we have, for example, Oculus, right? <laughs> it was in 2012. Um, so, yeah, I, all these things here created like, different business opportunities and markets that weren't there when, when I started creating games. So who, who knows what, <laughs> how, what will be playing in 15 years? No, no, no one can really know it. But and of course, we're not sure of, of the game experience that will be developed, developed. But I'm pretty sure about something, right? Is that there will be players. And there will be players that will play in our game. So regardless of the trends and technology, and maybe the audiences are changing a bit, but uh, sometimes we, we forget that. This the, the actual real, really important thing. So for example, when you're making a game, you're learning a, a ton of things. Some things that are uh, genre or platform specific. If you are doing a first person shooter in consoles, you will learn uh, a lot of things about camera collision, aiming system, combat AI, uh, pipelines for assets, animation, but uh, uh, you get experience with that. But also, you for you learn a lot of things that are not specific from the genre or even the platform. So you understand how to understand better your players, your audience, how to convey information, how to teach a new game mechanic, the importance of feedback, what is an interesting choice, what selling point, you, you became better at understanding the core concepts of, of game design. And this knowledge, I'm not saying that it's better or worse than the other, but at least it's a knowledge that stays with you when you move from one place to another. I will say it's more transferable, uh, flexible, and it also lets you grow. So if I share my, my experience, uh, about that. So once upon a time, long time ago, I belonged to the master race of PC console game designers. Uh, I show you some of the games that were in 2004, 2005. Um, these were the games I was playing. Yeah, when, when I started making, well, or a few years after, after, I, after I started making professional games. So my expectations about the games I wanted to make were exactly <laughs> related to the games I've been playing for my full life. And I was happy about that because I was making this kind of games. I made Next Quest, I made Dive, that is pretty unknown, but it's a super cool game. And when I was working on these games that somehow resembled me, the, the, the games I, I love to play, this is what I was making a lot of money, but, but tons of money. And, and I remember that I was talking about these games and I said, oh, these are like crop harvesting games. I tended to look at this game as they were minor kind of games because I was the one who was making console games. 
you remember even, don't know if you know, like Code Clicker that was made by Ian Bogos, which is an um, academic scholar. Uh, it was kind of joke about uh, Farmville and these social games, and, and he even made money with, with it. So, yeah, I, I, I did like these games. I was making something like that, Deadlight. It was like kind of serious looking game that was pretty cool. I went to the uh, PAX East. It was, it was launched in the summer of arcade. Uh, it got a BAFTA nomination in 2013. So yeah, I, I feel I was completely part of this master race. Yeah. And then something happened. <laughs> and unexpected and i have to find a new job and i had to find a new job super quick and where i was based that time in, in madrid there was basically no options in this like kind of indie or triple a console games so and i didn't want to move so i have to change my job and a company that is Oh, there we go. He's back. Nope. Looks like we might have had a delay here. Uh, hold on a second, guys. We're going to get in touch with him and get the stream going again. The notes are still going, surprisingly. <laughs> He's still talking on the slides. So we just got to get the camera stream. Oh. Hey, uh, Lucas, do you mind going yep. back uh, one slide? We lost you for about 30 seconds. So 30 it was, seconds? So yes. this slide is okay? Y yes, this start from slide, there, yeah. please. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so so basically after like being like on, on the sky, I'm very happy about how good I feel about becoming a master race game designer. Uh, I had to look for another job. You know, I, uh, it was like completely like fall from the sky to, to the land. And at that moment, in the position where I was, where I was living, I, I, I couldn't continue like this, like triple A console thing. And the best position I find was doing something that was different what what I was doing. So I I started working on mobile free to play games. I joined Gale of in a super awesome team, a super awesome project. But I didn't feel good about switching to 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 mobile. I I had spent so many years disregarding mobile games and free-to-play that took me a while until, until I realized how how rich and how important for my life is going is was going to be like this next step. So I spent three years in Gatelove and released two games, which was cool, <laughs> but this was not the more important thing. I learned so much more about game design, how to make games more accessible, more modular, uh, how to really dig into balancing <laughs> with economy, monetization, usability, user experience, marketability, pitching. I mean, it was much more than what I was expecting. And actually, this free-to-play change opened me doors to, to new opportunities. And I became product manager in Septolab, the Cut the Rope guys, which is a super awesome company. And actually, I changed from this lead game designer position to the first time ever. I, I was not like exactly a game designer, I, and I became product manager. But I became product manager because of my years of experience as console game designer and my experience as a mobile free-to-play game designer. And this was completely unexpected when I started my career as game designer. And because of that, I have the chance to be part of the creation of this game that maybe you know, maybe not, but uh, it's super awesome. It was a Google Play game of the year, 2017. And after one year, it got 100 uh, million installs. Can you can you imagine making like a, a, a console game and getting so many installs? And also because of this like mobile free to play, I fulfilled my dream of going to the GDC as actually I went to the GDC as a speaker. Actually, I went twice to the GDC. I was managed to become judge for the IGF. That is something that to be, I like it. And also I had the chance to 
be involved in super inspiring and, and rich opportunities. And all these things were because I moved from console games to, to mobile games. And yeah, thanks God I, I, I changed. Because the thing is that, of course, I, I, I never wanted to make mobile games. But, but this to me makes sense because it was not in my DNA. It was impossible for me to want this because no one knew at that point what, what the free to play was going to be. And so when I had to move, I didn't find any AAA company, but I found this like really solid position in a mobile game company. And I could have been trying to work in console games or move to another country, but Yes, I, I decided to to follow this thing that was there and it worked. Maybe maybe another thing would have been better or not, but you don't, you cannot know this. So you can know this. So when you have to change, of course, it will be scary. It will be you feel uncomfortable, but just move forward and, and, and just keep doing the stuff and, and forget about this these things. But here what I want to, to, to convey is not only this change are good mantra and this stuff. It's something about A, you need to prepare and to be ready for ready for, 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 for these changes that because this will happen. This guy will be knocking at your door at some point and you will be ready for that. Just read the news, talk to game developers. I mean it's <laughs> very unlikely, I guess, to, to find a game developer that after 10 years or even less he's been fired or, or his company has got bankrupt or, or, or something like that. It's, it's, it's every day there. So you need to be ready to, to adapt in order to survive in this game dev jungle. Um, but this adaptation could mean like many things. It's not only about, hey, I need to use the, the last tools and I need to learn the last technologies that yes of course you have to do that but it's also about making the most of the place where you are at this moment because maybe you are not in the best studio or you don't have the best job or the job you wanted to do but I'm sure that in the job that you are you, you are at this moment you, you can like learn things that it will make you more available in the future. Yeah, and to become better. So, uh, just practice stuff that, that, but the things that you believe it will be helpful to you. My first job before getting into the game industry was in a very um, dry and to me sad IT consulting company. I was like doing things for telecom companies and yeah, I did. I didn't like it at all. It, I, but I, I got that job. And I decided to try to still like to focus on, for example, coding. And if I could like pick like different roles or different positions in the projects, I started like, okay, coding. Why coding? Because I believe that this coding experience, if it's not just game related, it will help me to 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 get into the game industry. And um, basically, it worked. <laughs> so yeah, maybe your your current job sucks. Um, maybe you know that you won't be a lot of time there, but just try to to adapt to this environment and learn things that will be helpful to you. My second recommendation is just make friends or, or maybe at least don't, don't make enemies because the, the people that you are working today, I mean, someone <laughs> will probably be hiding you or will be recommending you or not in the future. So yes, this is also something to, 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 to do when you are in a place, yes, Try to, to, to work nice, to, to meet people, because this is the way that you are also building your, your, your career that you don't know where it will bring you to. And also uh, pick projects that you feel they will be relevant. I mean, sometimes, mm, sometimes you just are thinking of your salary and you need that salary or that position and, and, and this is fine. But what I believe is that uh, the most time that you spend involved in projects that you really, really love, uh, the, the best will be your career. Because you, you will be learning much more things and, and you will be 
especially if you believe in the projects, it means that these projects are relevant to what you like, and this will be relevant for your career. So, so this is important. Just match, at least try to match, if possible, uh, the, the, the companies and the projects with, with the things that, that, that you like. And the third thing is just try to diversify, because when you are working as a game dev, this is cool, but there are many things out there that you can do that are like related to game development. But like, for example, you can start myself, I start teaching, or you can maybe do music or public speaking or journalism or things that are really, really connected with what the things that you are doing at this very moment. Um, also, when you do that, this other stuff, it also helps you to, to, to become a better game developer. I mean, for example, to me, teaching is a very good example because w when you need to teach concepts, you really need to understand them. And this makes you even more valuable as a, as a, as a game developer. And this might even open doors in the future. To me, to me, my last example is the current company I'm working in. This is not a game company. This is a research company. It belongs to Telefonica, which is a very, very big telecom. And it's called the, 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 the first and the only moonshot factory in Europe. So they are building super huge projects. They're trying to change the, the, the world in the way like Google X is doing. And it's a research project, project and it's about learning. And it has to do also with games. And basically, why I'm here? Well, because I follow my career and start like doing stuff. And, and eventually, uh, I get to a position where, when I was ready for, for this. So that's it. Just be prepared and embrace changes because they will be there. So that's it. Thanks for watching this. Yes. And please, you know, here's my email. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can follow me on Twitter, anything. Yes, guys, I'm, I'm here, please. Well, Lucas, okay. first, thank you very much for your presentation, man. And thanks for being a part of our stuff. Again, we've had you on the podcast before. So happy to see you at our GDC party. And even more happy to see you here helping us make the inaugural GDUX an actual thing. So just so you know, the Twitch chat has been lit up with everyone having discourse about mobile and their views on mobile. As you're hitting talking points, they're having conversation. So you, you've, you've, you've uh, ignited some change in the world, my good sir. So thank you very much, man. I really appreciate this. And I, I definitely agree. Like Larry and myself, like we, we come from a background of a lot of AAA development. I mean, that... I have to say that is the reason why I went into games is because of the big games that I played as a kid growing up to finally going to college and it's like I want to work on these huge games yeah. and I've accomplished that. But at the same time, in the corner of my eye, this huge industry on the side is growing, which is the mobile industry and it's like Flappy Birds, <laughs> it's like making 50,000 a, it's making 50,000 a day. My salary a day, what is this? It's like this? What is mobile? And every time you go onto these train cars and everybody's like playing a game I've never heard of. And it's like, I've never felt so old when I see everybody on these commutes playing games I've never seen or heard. Everyone's playing it. It's like, what is this? Why am I so out of the loop? Mm -hmm. And it's one of those recognition that you are just, the industry is just growing up without you. Yeah. And uh, it's, changing it's, very real. it's changing rapidly. Seriously. And you can lose trace of it real quick. And there are really three different sectors, like yeah. the mobile crowd, the indie crowd, and the AAA crowd are completely different people. And uh, I, I, though some have, like yourselves, moved in and out of uh, the, the, the different sectors, uh, a lot of just stay, just stay within their lanes and then and, and don't really explore. Uh, I, another thing that I love about your talk is that, you know, uh, it wasn't like a conscious decision to go to mobile for you. It was you kind of uh, prioritizing wanting to live where you want to live, which is a... S which to people out there it feels like a simple ask but it's like it's the a monumental decision it's like do i want to move for my job no okay then i need to figure out other avenues and be very creative um so obviously this 
uh, dials in with everybody that you live with, including your wife and children. It's like, uh, what are those conversations like? I mean, I'm sure you you kind of explore, but then you looked at those options and then just decided, no, I, I'd rather just stay where I am. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in, in this case, specifically the point when, when I moved from console to to mobile was because yeah you are browsing offers and you see like a pretty i mean it was like lead game designer position in in Gayloft. and i knew people there and people there knew me because i worked with them before so i kind of know that the some things about the projects i realized that the projects were nice so it's like okay let's let's do this Let's do this because you know if if you don't do this, then someone will get that position, and then you will need to find something, and you don't know it will appear or so. And then when you're there, it's like okay, so these are just games, right? <laughs> um, what what I want to do, I want to to make games. So and I want my games to be played by and enjoyed by as much people as possible, as many just so so well. Mobile is, is a really nice environment for that. And and this is what, yeah, uh, well, yeah, I, 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 I had to admit that I spent like some <laughs> years actually questioning myself. Hey, I'm, I'm here because of the money. I'm here because of the position. I'm here, I'm like cheating to, to myself. But I think that this was all like, because so it's like, my generation, you know, like we grew, we grew with with console and controllers in our hands. So anything that is not that, it feels weird. And um, but eventually, yes, to me, it was an awesome move. And, and what I'm trying to say with this talk is that maybe tomorrow there's a new technology that or a new platform, and maybe you don't like it because yes, you you don't know anything about it. Because no one's known, because these new platforms maybe require years to really get a bit more ma mature. So just go there and, and try it. And, and I'm sure that what, I mean, I, for example, another example I want to bring is educational games or, or when you are making games for kids. It's like some other people look at these games and, and say, like, they're like less game <laughs> than other, or that are the developers there, they are like, lesser or, or something like that there are like so many things that you need to nail down if you are making games for kids that eventually you can also bring this uh, uh, knowledge to, to things that you are doing in some other places so it's just i like this like let's say <laughs> holistic <laughs> way of 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 everything is about games and the more time you spend making games and for different audience, the, the, the more you will know about the media. And this is ultimately a lot of value for you. All right, Lucas, we've got a next question is from Left Handed Heather, uh, who asks, I'd be interested in hearing Lucas's thoughts on this. Do you see any of the subsection of mobile games breaking from the free to play model and being treated in a serious game capacity, similar to like how we value like high end AAA games? Do you see any of the like free to play mobile games breaking out of that like, oh, you're a mobile game box going into, oh, you are free to play, but you're a cultural phenomenon, you are a top level gaming experience, even though it costs me nothing to play you? Yeah, but how many people is playing um, like, Candy Crush, right? <laughs> or, or because I was going to say like Clash of Clans or or Clash Royale, I, that maybe I feel more connection that with with Candy Crush, but I'm sure that Candy Crush is much bigger cultural theme than a lot of mobile games, right? So this is one one thing, and the other thing is like now look at PUBG and and all these games they are also mobile, so my so I think that this, like, mm, don't know, prestigious competition about what is more important or less important is only in in, in the head of, of of the game developers of of I will say even maybe of older players because I mean this generation they are growing up with with the mobile. So when 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 they became 
mobile game developers, I mean, like game developers or even players, they, 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 their references will be about mobile games. So, so I don't think the, the, the um, I think that both universes will be a bit separate, but not because of, of being more, has more importance or prestigious, be more prestigious than the other. It's just because they are like different audiences. Question here from Pure Evil. Uh, I feel like we hear a lot less about actual studios doing mobile games as well. So I'm, I'm guessing on Media Polygon or Kotaku, you know, any of these popular sites. Why do you think that is? Is it related to the misconception that mobile games are a niche genre? Yeah, I mean, if, if you read, if you read like Slide to Play or Pocket Gamer, it really a bit the opposite, right? The thing is that. Um, sometimes I have the feeling that console or indie gamers and developers, I'm including myself, right? <laughs> because sometimes I, I feel like that. We, we believe that games are like ours, right? Uh, so, and, the, and then we, we are just reading the places that are that behave in the same way, you know, like, oh, I, a review in Kotaku is much more important than that, that for example, <laughs> in, in, my, in my experience, is just, just getting reviewed in Kotaku is, is, for some people, is more important than getting like 100 million downloads in, in one year. And this makes no sense at all. But it's because we are giving some, I, I, I mean, and Kotaku is great, I mean, and, and if you are this kind of, a creator that, that you're looking for this audience, this is what actually probably is super meaningful for you. I mean, myself, for example, I, I, I love the, the Independent Games Festival and, uh, and, I, and I don't find many mobile free-to-play games there, right? But, but the thing is that it's, I don't believe that uh, there is like, like less noise. What I believe is that maybe most of the people that maybe we are here today is because we are thinking about console and PC and we are reading things or blogs, or books, or whatever about people that are in the same uh, environment. So this makes feel that no one is talking about the, the other side. So I've got a question for you then. I remember the initial like grassroots days of iPhone App Store when iPhone games were first hitting. Like you have individual creators behind games like Trism, you know, somebody making iFart uh, versus now all the top apps I feel like, or all the ones that I know of are behind companies, behind big development teams. Do you feel like in 2019, it's still possible or there's still ways for the individual creator to still make a bang or make a boom in any sort of the mobile marketplaces? No, I don't, I, I don't think so. No, because, yeah, I mean, it's just, even to me, it's very difficult. It's just name one really successful and good uh, free-to-play mobile game designer. <laughs> yeah, is is we they are they are not existing. I mean, this this authorship thing, I believe, is coming just from the AAA game and especially from AAA games like from ten years ago, because the authors that we have now are somehow authors that that were already like creating games like. Than years ago, or uh, these indie game developers, and also again, it's like we know the names of indie game developers because we like indie game developers. So for us, it's like super big, and Jonathan Blow is amazing, and blah 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 blah. But for everyone who is playing while commuting Candy Crush, it's like I don't care about who <laughs> who is Jonathan Blow. It's just to me what is like making my life uh, better is this game that I'm playing while, while, while commuting, right? And, and I think this has, this is the actual value of, of, of games. The other thing is something that is also about uh, authorship, um, to have these uh, idols and culture and prestige, prestige, you know, it's, it's a bit different. Yeah, uh, I have a, a personal question, actually. Well, I'm not personal, but my own question. 
So the mobile industry okay. is, of course, is growing. It's changing. The subscription model, I think, is starting to come in as a new way to play mm. um, with the Apple Arcade influx and all these different ways to kind of, I think, uh, in a way, curate the content, right? It's a very saturated market. And uh, maybe Apple, aside from cashing in, I, I think they're trying to feel like this is a solution to kind of field in these are these are the games that we picked mm -hmm. these are the games you will enjoy so enjoy them for a subscription fee do you how do you feel about that is that going to help uh, alleviate some of the noise that's out there well this i mean i'm i'm thinking about this theme at this moment because i i know a lot of uh, Spanish game developers that, I mean, for example, in Barcelona, there are a, a lot of really cool uh, indie game developers, and they are always talking about this saturation of, of Steam. So, um, I think that everything is saturated, you know? I mean, at this moment, there is no like any blue ocean where you can go and no one is there. Uh, well, you know, Snapchat. Snapchat or, or any platform to know is if we are, yeah. So the thing is that about the Apple Store, for example, these changes. Initially, I I didn't like them <laughs> because it's like, hey, I don't have this free gain of the week that I want just to play for free. But now, if you browse it, it looks like something more, uh, let's say, serious. You know. Hey, someone is actually paying attention to the games, and someone is offering some specific cool games with specific topics. And I think this is great. This is great. But uh, this is saturated. It's saturated, and, and then you have the other problem. OK, I'm making this game, and now I need to please somehow Apple or, or Google or whatever, because it's like not my publisher, but kind of of my publisher. So I think it's better for the media and for the perception of the media or for their like audiences, because you know it feels like more curated and serious. But for the saturation, I think it's, it will be still like I mean it's, it's impossible. It's impossible. Everything is filled. So the next question I have for you, sir, is from uh, Typhoon in Twitch chat. Do you have any advice for designing monetization correctly on mobile? What are some of the most important considerations? Um, I, I have my a theory that I, I, I want to share. Well, to, to me, first, I am completely advocating of uh, being respectful to players. Super. I mean, there are like thousands of different ways to, to trick players into into buying stuff. But I think that this eventually will uh, give, uh, back, well, backfire you at, at some point. So to me, this, this is the first thing. And, and there are like many successful games. But yeah, that, that they're like very respectful with, with, <laughs> with players. So, so this is like that. Um, and the thing is that what I feel, I mean, during the GDC, I, I, I went to a super cool talk from the Merch Dragon guy. Um, he was talking about monetization mechanics, um, game mechanics. And what I have the feeling is that maybe, uh, I mean, ga game designers, we have, a, or, or the game designers that I know, uh, we have a really good intuition about game mechanics. You are thinking about an experience that you want to deliver, and then you are building game mechanics around it. And then you put the monetization. And this is not the way to do. I mean, I think we, we, we need to go to some, in, in the same way that if you are making an RPG, you know that your players will be grinding because you don't want, you don't want them to move like super fast. And this is something of natural process where you are like creating the game. I'm questioning why we don't do the same with monetization. Why, why, why monetization is not appearing like in a very, uh, natural way from, from, from the game design. And um, my guess, oh, I mean, of course, you need to model and you have control models and you need to have some target goals and everything is not changing. It's just about like why we are like copying everyone. 
<laughs> you know why why we cannot innovate in monetization and, and i think because basically we we game designers we don't have enough connection with with the the the, the monetization i mean i i was lucky to, to be working on Septolab. I uh, don't know if you have played King of Thieves. Um, King of Thieves, besides being a super cool game, it has a very unique monetization system because it's based not on, on chess or timers, although it has some timers, but it has spinners. You can spin, and if you don't get what you want, you can respin. Um, it's kind of unique, and it fits really nice, the, the, the game. And to me, it's a very good example of some monetization mechanics that is emerging from, from, from the gameplay. And um, so my advice or what I believe is that is just to don't feel that when try, try to, to work this like, oh, I need to put monetization on this game. No, it's, you don't need to put monetization of, on this game. It's like you, you need to feel connected with this monetization system in the same way that you are connected with, with the navigation system or the inventory or stuff like that. It's just another part of the game. This, but. But I, I don't know if it's doable. What I believe is that the more, let's say, native free-to-play game designers, experienced free-to-play game designers we have, I think this will become more like uh, something that we will be uh, able to, to, to play and to see. So I have a question uh, regarding uh, China. So we had Sam Wei on, on day one, and he was talking about how... Um, the Chinese are very good at cloning games and in the mobile market I feel like it's more and more frequent in that sector yeah. uh, what's the fear in that like uh, how do you try to at least design around that knowing that somebody over there is gonna gonna duplicate your success once you hit that okay but by the way I was watching the, the I, 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 I was like watching with the talk but I still was preparing mine <laughs> So this is the, the worst part of being on day three that I couldn't enjoy the rest of the, of the talks, right? Um, I mean, even in my experience in Theptola, we, we have this issue, okay? Even with soft launches, we have like people with even almost like kind of copying the stuff. Um, I don't have a really good answer for that because I haven't really suffered I have just a generic opinion, and, and to me, the, the generic opinion is that um, I think that eventually copying is not going to work. I mean, it, it will work initially, but but um, you know, it's, it's it's this thing that we say about the, the ideas, right? So, stealing an idea for someone is it, it's completely. Uh, <laughs> junk. I mean, I mean it's, it's always about this. What we what we call about like execution execution of 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 the idea, and I still believe on that. You know, okay, maybe someone has copied me this, but the evolution that I'm gonna give to my game, or the level of, of polishing or understanding of the game mechanics that I I will follow is different from 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 what this other guy is doing. And okay, this guy is stealing me my money at this moment. But yeah, it's also, I mean, <laughs> this happened also w w before China, right? Like companies that releasing game mechanics that are coming from another game. We have this example about, it's not copying, right? But many ideas of inspiration from other games, like you know, to start with, for example, with Minecraft, you know, from Infinity Miner. I mean, another example of someone being like super innovative with some gameplay but not making money, and then someone is coming after, implementing a bit better the same idea, and um, I'm making a lot of money. So, yeah, I think, but I don't have a company, and I haven't suffered it. So I, I can't tell more from a point of view of, of like, creation that is like, okay, so this guy has copied me. Okay, good luck, because <laughs> my, my ideas and my brain and my processes, they are with me and, and are not with him. But yeah, I mean, I, I cannot bring more, more experience in, in, into that. All right, man, Lucas, 
thank you for taking through your expertise and sharing it with everybody in the audience today, man. It's uh, super motivating to hear anybody go through like, hey, you know, I was here, had to make a change. I was here, had to make a change. Got fired, had to make a change. I, I definitely want to bring back those those topic points because this is about change and survivability. As much as we want to pull from your mobile and indie experience to learn how to make our games better, I do want to hint that like we want people to be agile, we want people to be prepared and ready to respond yeah. to what life throws at them. And you have had such a great path of bouncing back from any bad thing, but then also looking forward to jump towards the next new thing that you thought was going to be great for you. I'm so happy to hear that you're still pioneering your own path through life. And thank you for helping everybody today do a little bit more of that for themselves. Yeah, it's a it's a great honor, man. And it, it's definitely a thing that I think every game developer have to be on their toes for yeah. just getting ready to get their next thing going uh the industry is always changing around us as soon as we focus on one thing something else is happening like this whole influx of streaming games is a whole different type of tech like what does that mean exactly do the developers get paid beforehand mm. like netflix style Are you, like the stadia stuff the stadia okay. stuff the, the microsoft stuff the playstation stuff okay. this is the next wave this the is the next pass, wave Apple Arcade. yeah okay. just getting away from the hardware and all being internet and getting away from owning anything it's all it's a whole different way of thinking about uh playing games to be honest it's like I, I go on youtube i click on a button and i start playing well you know brandon as soon as you own it you stop paying me oh i see so that's the <laughs> <laughs> um so i can only imagine uh because of the mobile industry being the juggernaut that it is it has influenced the way that people are thinking for the bigger games as well and i mean bigger as in like more people and i can that's not even even true like i feel like these mobile companies are like in the thousands at this point so it's it's excuse my ignorance but it's 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 crazy it's like once i pay stop paying attention to one part and the other part is just like outgrowing me and i have so much to learn mm. So uh, uh, with that being said, like um, this is your platform, Lucas. Thank you for joining us. If there's anything that you want to uh, uh, say, do, we do have your Twitter handle. If you guys want to continue the conversation, uh, besides being on Twitch, uh, go ahead and just go ahead and tweet in at Lucas, I think. Yeah. All love and hates. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm going to switch to you. Uh, any last words? No, I mean, I, I was thinking that about this uh, adaptation, um, survivability and survival, well, whatever. I mean, you are like super good examples too of what you are doing now. Yeah, this, this, this is great. Um, yeah, yes, please subscribe to me. <laughs> yeah, I have nothing to do. No, it's, it's not like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very important to, to, to create connections and, and to let other people at least try to 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 help you or, or give advices i mean I, I wish i would have this opportunity like 10 or, or 15 years ago um yes guys and please continue doing what you're doing this is great um thanks for you for for putting me in this in this position today Hey, I've said it before, man. If you weren't here, this would just be a black screen. So we actually, we're thanking you. For, you just filled yeah. up this space for us in this Seriously. slot. And uh, man, like from the first time we talked to you on the podcast to now and seeing you at the party and realizing how much taller you are than me, uh, it was well, just finally. <laughs> yeah, people are used to like this face right here, but like, yeah, when we bulked out, it's like it's our Hulk moment. So I, I thank you, Lucas, and this is a, a part of a long, long relationship, obviously, and uh, we are doing our best as well. The reason, like, I never thought ten years ago I'll be in front of a mic talking, right? Mm. Now in front of a camera, but like the the, the opportunities that had lend itself us meeting more people outside of just our workplace, it has been amazing. Like it's it has opened up so many doors, and that is part of adapting to change. It's like there's so many things you can do besides just being behind the desk to do game development and be part of this business because hell yeah everybody else is profiting everyone else is doing a great job just streaming games talking about game it's a part of this culture in every single way and everybody seems to be doing well except for maybe the game developer who's still kind of struggling 
and we're the reason why the game industry is actually going on and and you know we're just trying to spread the love out there so that everybody out there is uh you know appreciate appreciate the the games that you're playing on on stream right now <laughs> yep so again guys i mean i i yes i i don't have much to 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 say um so that's it guys <laughs> now we are a bit like um speechless which for me is very strange <laughs> Um, yeah. Lucas, uh, you're a big inspiration for me, man. So I just want to let you know, thank you for doing what you do. Thanks for helping me do what I do a little better. And we just really appreciate your time. Okay. So yes, yeah. help me for anything you do, guys. All right. Well, I need to sure. clean my house next week. So please, uh, <laughs> okay, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, 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 you, if, if you pay the treat, I will clean your house. <laughs> All, right. All right. see you, brother. <laughs>